If you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, please do so right now so that you get notified every time a new video comes up. Hello and welcome back to Nibble Pop. In this class, we will be starting with the text of Paradise Lost Book 1 and we'll be dealing specifically with the invocation. If you haven't yet watched the three introductory videos that I have already posted on Paradise Lost, go back to them and watch them before you proceed any further with the text. Alright, so I hope you will enjoy this class and stay with me till the end of this class. Before beginning a detailed study of the invocation in Paradise Lost Book 1, let us first know what invocation means. Invocation means an appeal or a prayer to a higher power. This is a very common convention of epic poets, especially of classical epic poets, who stated the theme or the object of their work as well as prayed to a higher entity for inspiration to write a big book. All right. Therefore, an invocation has two parts. First, the part where the poet tells about the theme of the work which he is going to write and second the prayer itself all right so in case of milton also we'll find that he is sticking to this convention of invoking to a higher power and at the same time going away from it all right for milton we have to keep in mind that he was a man who was full of classical learning. You remember, uh, if you have gone through his biography, you will, uh, I'm sure you will uh, remember that he was a man who had a lot of knowledge about uh, literary works that went throughout the history of human civilization. Therefore, it is very difficult for him to dissociate himself from those works and write something very new and very fresh. Another thing that is worth noting is that he is writing on a topic which is known to everybody. So what is he going to add to it? If he is to add to it, he has to rely on a higher power than common literary knowledge. Okay. With this introduction, let us go to the text and through the text, let us try to understand what Milton is doing in his invocation. Of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree, whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe, with loss of Eden, till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat, sing heavenly muse. So when the invocation begins, he is going on using clauses after clauses till he reaches the point he, when he mentions heavenly muse finally and you realize that all he has done is give to you the theme of what he is going to write. So in the very first sentence, the sentence is not yet over, in the very first sentence you are given the theme of the poem as well as the prayer itself. All right. So let us go through the uh, clauses one by one of man's first disobedience. What is he talking about? He is talking about that act of Adam and Eve, that act of eating the forbidden fruit. Why was the fruit forbidden? Because God asked them not to eat it. So when somebody asks you not to do something, it is called forbidden. Okay. So Adam and Eve did not have that choice which is actually very ironical because it is as if God is giving them a kind of free will to choose and at the same time asking them not to choose. Okay, so we will come into those discussions on free will and obedience later. Let us look at the second clause. And the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world. So fruit of that forbidden tree is linked to the first disobedience. Okay, and this fruit brought 
mortality to man which is the root cause of all our suffering okay so he is linking the whole thing up and then he is finally talking about eden with loss of eden so the result of consuming that forbidden fruit is the loss of eden okay so the first set of phrases and clauses they give us the consolidated theme of his work till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat now eden uh, is believed to be paradise which means it is a state where you don't have anything to uh, worry about you don't have any suffering in your uh, life so that blissful blissful means happy that happy place which was lost because of that act of disobedience that blissful state of paradise is reachable for man again through the lessons that jesus christ taught so the greater man in this part is none other than jesus christ why is he called the greater man because he was born as a man as a human being at the same time he was greater than anybody around him okay so jesus christ he taught us the ways of purifying ourselves going beyond those temptations and reaching the point where we are reunited with our paradise this is the christian belief sing heavenly muse so here milton is addressing his muse or his inspiring deity now who is a muse muse according to the classical mythologies uh, muses are deities of inspiration they are heavenly figures who inspire a poet to compose something or or an artist to compose something all right so they are technically classical here milton is using the expression heavenly muse now if muses now muses are not human agents okay they are heavenly agents so why does milton give this additional emphasis on the word heavenly because his muse is not one of the nine muses of classical mythology his muse has greater qualifications his muse is a christian muse so while following the convention while following the pattern of invocation he is also going away from it he is invoking the aid of a muse but his muse is not the classical muse so here milton is following epic convention and at the same time going beyond it okay so this is how we are going to look at the invocation how he is being more original than his predecessors okay now he is going on qualifying his muse now when it is the case of classical poets they don't need to qualify their muses they just need to name them that this is my muse that is my muse because their characteristics are known to people but since milton is talking about a different kind of agent of inspiration therefore he needs to give us information about this muse and what information does he give now he's talking about his muse here that on the secret top of oreb or of shinai did inspire that shepherd now we are totally lost we know about forbidden fruit we know about okay greater man is christ but who is the shepherd here whom is he talking about now milton is taking you away from the book itself and taking you away to the story of exodus so he begins with the story of genesis and suddenly he refers to something which is there in the story of exodus okay in the book of exodus and what is that story is the story of moses now if you remember my previous class lecture you will uh, know about this story of moses and uh, if you haven't watched the movie the 10 commandments yet i will really ask you to go and watch it sometime because that's going to help you with the references here moses in short i'll give you the story line uh, in a very brief way moses was born in egypt and he was the person whom god chose to rescue the israelites from the egyptians okay so the egyptian pharaoh he had enslaved these israelites and they were um, 
you know, given the job of building pyramids for uh, the Pharaoh and Moses, he ended up rescuing the Israelites. So he is like a shepherd who guide the flock of sheep to a safe place. In the same way, Moses guided his people out of Egypt. And there are beautiful uh, stories about the Red Sea party. You will know about all those stories if you watch the movie or you read the story of Exodus or story of Moses. Now here, what Milton is doing is he is cross-referencing. He is bringing in allusions or references to biblical figures who come much later in the story, who do not come in the storyline of Paradise Lost at all. But he is assuming a level of literacy, a level of Christian literacy from the readers. He thinks that the readers will be able to identify immediately that he is talking about Moses when he uses the expression shepherd and when he says uh, that uh, uh, this shepherd he was inspired on the mountain Oreb or of Shinai. So these are the mountain tops where God's voice spoke to Moses and therefore this God's voice is the heavenly muse of Milton. So you see what Milton is doing here. He is not just qualifying his muse. He is not just saying that my muse is superior to the classical muse of learning. He is promoting that muse to an even higher level, to the level of God himself, by saying that this muse had inspired Moses, who ended up rescuing the Israelites. Another reason why Moses is the shepherd here because in his exile Moses got married and his father-in-law Jethro he had a flocks of sheep which Moses acted as shepherd too. So he used to go around with his flock of sheep so technically he was a shepherd. Okay so these are the two reasons why Moses is called the shepherd here. Now what did Moses do after the heavenly voice taught him things? Who first taught the chosen seed in the beginning how the heavens and earth rose out of chaos. So chosen seed, chosen seed means chosen people. So these Israelites, these people of Israel who followed Moses out of Egypt, they were chosen by God and Moses through his knowledge gained from that heavenly voice, he taught these Israelites about the creation of the world. See, see this expression, how the heavens and earth rose out of chaos. Now, according to Christian belief, the world was created by God out of chaos. So it was a transition from chaos. Chaos means uh, where no order is there, where nothing has any meaning, where everything is in disorder that is chaos. So out of that chaos God created cosmos or something which has order which has beauty. So that knowledge was something which the higher agency or that that heavenly voice gave to Moses and Moses passed that knowledge to the chosen seed. Now he is talking to his muse again or if Zion Hill delight thee more, and Siloah's brook that flowed fast by the oracle of God, I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song. And then he is referring to Zion Hill and Siloah's brook. So he is referring to these biblical uh, words, you know, Zion, Siloah's brook, to show that he is linking his muse directly to the faith of Christianity and he is asking his muse who uh, resides in these holy places to inspire him. Okay, and how to inspire him? Invoke thy age to my adventurous song. He calls his poem an adventurous song. It is as if he is embarking on a journey and he really needs the blessings for the uh, journey to go on smoothly. Okay, so he is calling his poem an adventure. And then he is qualifying his attempt. What is he trying to write? That with no middle flight intends to soar above the Ionian mount, while it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. 
So you remember the classical muses who used to uh, stay on Mount Olympus, that is the Aeonian Mount, the Greek mountain, Mount Olympus and that mountain is sacred to Greek poets because they think they are inspiring muses, they stay there. Apollo stays there. Okay, But in Milton's case, since his muse resides on a higher plane, Milton wants to claim that his poetry is going to go beyond the Aeonian Mount. And look at the expression middle flight. He is comparing his work to the flight of a bird. You will have these images all throughout Paradise Lost. And here it is very prominent that he is seeing himself as a creature driven by a force of God which enables him to go beyond the ordinary level of flight. Flight is what? The height in which a bird is flying. An eagle takes a higher flight than a sparrow. Okay, So Milton is going to go for that highest flight possible because he is going to be inspired by the heavenly muse. And look at this confidence when he is saying that he is going to write something unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. So he is not just going to surpass uh, every poetry ever written, but even every prose ever written, any literary thing that is there in the history of mankind, he is claiming that. And that includes the Bible because the Bible is also a written text. It includes all the scriptures that have gone before him. That is a very tall claim. And who is making this claim? A man who is not at all politically powerful anymore, who is in hiding and who is losing a very vital power, the power of sight. So this man who is totally subdued by circumstances, defeated by circumstances, is claiming to write something unattempted yet in prose and rhyme. This is a tall claim. This is an ambitious claim. This is the claim of a man who is inspired by Renaissance. So this claim puts Milton on the rank with the spirit of the Renaissance which preceded him. Okay. And what does he write just after this? And chiefly thou, O spirit, that does prefer before all temples the upright heart and pure. He is further qualifying his muse. His muse is not just the Christian God, which is the God of the Puritans and the God of the Catholics. It is the God who responds to the Puritan spirit of Milton who does not care for temples, architecture, rituals, things which matter to the Catholics. So here you see what he is doing. He is further bringing down the focus to this single agent of inspiration who is a Puritan God. All right. So you see how his Puritan ethos come in, how his Renaissance spirit comes in. And at the same time, what happens in the next few lines is even more remarkable. Instruct me, for thou knowest, thou from the first was present and with mighty wings outspread, dove-like sat brooding on the vast abyss and made it pregnant. So now he is talking about the creative power of God and he is again using the image of a bird here uh, just like a bird you know roosts on the eggs and uh, the eggs eventually hatch it is in the same way god was sitting protectively on the um, on the chaos and the abyss means that 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 gap that vacuum which had nothing in it so from that vacuum god created everything which you can see. Okay, so then again you have that image of the bird coming up. What in me is dark illumine? What is low raise and support? So he was just talking about his tall claim of uh, trying to write something which has never been written and now he is talking about uh, his deficiencies his darkness, his ignorance. So here you see Milton in a different light. And he says, 
what in me is dark illumined now he is not just talking about his physical blindness when he uses the word dark he is also talking about the ignorance in him and he wants illumination illumine means to throw light on he wants the heavenly muse to turn his darkness into light and what is low rays and support so he wants the heavenly muse to not just act as an inspiration but to act as a guiding force as a mentor and why does he need that because he feels that when he is taking up a topic which is non classical which is christian he cannot rely on the classical guidance he cannot rely on the works of the poets who were inspired by the nine greek muses so he has to have only one teacher has to have only one guidance that is the voice of god another reason why he is doing this is that in the readers questions might arise as to how come you know about creation how come you know about things uh, which are actually beyond you now how can one human being know about creation heaven hell what went before human beings were created how is he going to uh, give an account of all these things now here milton passes the responsibility of authority that it is not my knowledge it is the knowledge given to me by the voice of god and he is somehow equating himself with moses with noah with the figures who could hear god all right so in a way this is again a very you can say a very egoistic assertion that he is chosen to be the one to pass the message so while the invocation places wilton as a as an ambitious man as an adventurous man uh, and as an experimenting man because he is experimenting with the form itself it is also placing him as a puritan humble spirit who wants to rely on god's voice okay and why is he doing this what is the ultimate object of his work what is the ultimate theme of his work that to the height of this great argument i may assert eternal providence providence means the way god is meeting out justice providence means judgment okay and what is the final statement that he makes and justify the ways of god to men so this word justify is important here because he is not just going to tell us about what happened he is not just going to tell us about why adam and eve fell from eden he is not going to tell us about how god punished them but how was that punishment justified and how he is planning to do this is through the inspiration of god's voice so it is as if god is justifying his ways to us through milton all right that is again passing responsibility to god himself in other ways we can say that this is a deeply personal quest because a man who is bowed down by life who is defeated by uh, brutal forces opposing him it was important for milton to somehow justify himself or the suffering which he was going through and you see strangely uh, as a side note i always feel that if milton had not suffered so much if milton uh, or cromwell uh, had not fallen or the government had not fallen then what would have happened to milton he would have remained as the most important literary figure in england and uh, what was his job then he used to translate documents written in foreign language uh, documents related to governance uh, court orders and uh, such prosaic things so if this whole catastrophe had not happened 
then Paradise Lost will it have been written I don't know if not then from the point of view of a reader a literary uh, connoisseur I would say that that whole suffering was justified because of the poetry which it led to okay so this this book is definitely going to justify his suffering at least at least give some consolation that this this book is the mark that you have not suffered in vain this suffering has given rise to something beautiful similarly he thinks that when god's justice is meted out it is always justified all right so is he talking about obedience as a compulsion here is he saying that because god's justice is justified or god's decision is justified is always correct therefore we should always be obedient to god those are the questions which need a more detailed look at the whole text and not just the invocation but i can tell you one thing it is definitely differentiating between blind obedience and conscious obedience what is blind obedience when you don't know what is going to be the result of your action adam and eve they were not sure what would happen if they consumed the forbidden fruit because it was the tree of knowledge and therefore they did not have knowledge before they had the fruit that is irony that is the that is a paradox of the situation so after this after the fall they went through suffering and then and only then they realized the true consequence of that fall so after that if they decide to obey god then that obedience is a conscious obedience it is not a blind obedience which demands no choice we will come to detailed discussion on free will problem of choice later when we finish the first book the, the reading of the first book but so far as the invocation is concerned you have to remember three things first it introduces us to the theme of the book which is the fall of man and problem of choice second is the invocation places milton as a puritan who wants to rely on the christian higher power instead of the classical muses and the third thing which the invocation gives us is it gives us an insight into milton's language for example he deliberately reverses the usual english word order repeatedly he begins the invocation with a series of phrases and clauses okay see of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal days brought death into the world and all our woe all these are short clauses and they are the object of the sentence where is the verb of this sentence sing heavenly muse so in normal english word order we place the subject then the verb and then finally the object of a sentence but in this case he is inverting the pattern and he is placing the object in the beginning of the sentence and it is as if adding up to it is it is working like a climax and that word sing heavenly muse rings out with resonance so this is what he is doing here and speaking of rhyme and rhythm since uh, milton was a uh, a remarkable user of blank verse if you look at uh, the the beginning of paradise lost you will notice that he is beginning with an iambic meter and then let's see what happens of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world it is not a regular iambic meter at all he is using pentameter and then there he is breaking that up when you read of man's first disobedience 
you cannot read it like a lullaby kind of iambic meter it breaks the rhyme breaks the rhythm breaks and it wants you to pause at these words to stress on these words and while you are stressing on these words you turn your attention to that word we will talk at length about milton's language his grand style once we finish the book we will be discussing important questions after our discussion on the text is over but for now uh, the invocation becomes a starting point towards our understanding of what to expect from paradise lost and the more you study the lines the more you realize that it is as much an epic about the story of bible as it is about the story of milton himself or maybe the story of any human being who goes through suffering and wants to justify that suffering that maybe something good is there hidden because i'm suffering now right so i will see you very soon with the next part of this text uh, where we will uh, see how milton describes hell and how the whole setting described beautifully in front of our eyes but for now i want you to go through the text of the invocation once more so that you are prepared for the next class so if you haven't subscribed do so now because then you will get notified whenever another class comes up and do tell me in the comment section if you want me to explain anything further from this portion and if you have liked this lecture or not so till next time have a great day bye bye